Now we'll move on to our first keynote speaker, the man who really needs no introduction, uh, but yet he somehow still has a video introduction that we'd like to go ahead and play for you right now. government spent billions of dollars going to the moon they got there um, and you know just as they got there everybody got colored television sets and they got to the moon it was pretty well black and white 1972 Apollo 17 last mission on the moon and during the Nixon administration shut it down we as Apollo's children felt we were Apollo's orphans we had been left out in the cold it was over in the government's minds but a lot of young kids there myself included were ready for what was next The right chemistry, the right mix, the right matrix of people, of vision, wealth, courage, a little bit of craziness, okay, a whole lot of craziness, teamed up and said, let's go do something important. Let's change the future. Walt pulled together an ad hoc group of people that he knew, and it wasn't so much a company, it was more kind of entourage. It was like they came out of a band. Here we were going to negotiate a deal to open a frontier in a place that felt like a frontier at the time. Here you had a serious situation to take over the manned space station. Would you like the space station? Because I think we can get it. We had a mega business plan that was going to grow into probably the biggest business plan ever. The audacity of leasing a 130-ton space asset and privatizing it is, is the realm of science fiction. Pressure was incredible. The Russians were being squeezed hard by the United States government to take the mirror out. Gus said, you're a doomed man if you do this. They are going to come after you with everything they got. Ladies and gentlemen, the co-founder of the Space Frontier Foundation, the founder of the Earth Life Institute, and from what you just saw, one of the founders of MirCore, I'd like to introduce Rick Tomlinson. Good morning. You are still alive. <laughs> Party hard, work hard, conquer the universe. Um, the reason I uh, had them run that video, I mean, many of you have seen this before, um, is because my great great friend Walt is getting out of the federal prison uh, in about a week and uh, I'm just really excited and uh, he's he's already got business plans he's already ready to kick it again uh, they did literally go after him with everything they had um, mainly the IRS which is the big one B2s are nothing compared to the IRS um, so I'm really uh, Really excited about that. Um, and, and just real quick, I want to say that about Walt. Uh, he, um, he was the first guy to really put his money where his mouth was. He was one of the first people to really step up as an entrepreneur uh, and do this kind of thing. And whatever his disagreements were with the IRS, that was their business. But he, he put it out there. He helped fund the first commercial space station, the first commercial crew to fly to orbit, the first commercial repair mission to orbit, and uh, activities that led to the sign-up of Dennis Tito, the first quote-unquote space tourist, et cetera. So I just want to honor him just for a moment there. All right. Um, welcome to the revolution. Oh, I forgot something. Hang on. Oh. oh, my God. How do I do that? Yeah. Welcome to the revolution. I'm going to get one of these made with rockets and a space helmet. i am just got to do that soon. I'm going to talk to you today about several things. We're going to start off a little bit slow, then we'll pick up a little speed, and then we're going to slow right down again, and then we're going to go into an audience participation. The first thing we're going to talk about is I'm going to explain 
my newest project, the Earthlight Institute. Um, then I'm going to uh, get into uh, what's going on uh, right now in space, why it needs to change, how it needs to change, and why this is so important. Then we're going to take a moment, switch out the computer, and then we're going to do an open audience discussion, uh, literal crowdsourcing discussion on um, an experiment, a thought experiment regarding Mars. Uh, so the next two hours are going to be very interesting. Um, and if it sucks, it's just not my fault. Um, part of this, too, some of you have seen. Um, uh, and that's fine. You, you've seen elements of this. I've done a, some of this stuff before. Uh, I, liked, I used to try and change up my talks every single time. And then a friend of mine pointed out that when Martin Luther King gave the I Had a Dream speech, he had done it 100 times. And um, so somewhere between now and 75 times later, I'll get this right. So the Earthlight Institute, what is it? Um, it's a new organization. I, I've been in the trenches, you know, fighting with the six guns, whatever you want to call it, fighting the battles for a long time. Um, we are in a period of time right now where, you know, we've gone through the phase of let's have the baby, new space, commercial space, let's protect the baby from the evil people. Now the baby's starting to drive the car. And we're all looking around going, that is a cool car. I live in a very rural town in Texas and, uh, um, right now, and I uh, go back and forth between Houston and there, and they have a Dairy Queen, and on Terry nights, everybody drives their cool cars up there. And I could just see it in our world, where everybody would be up there going, man, that, that dragon, dude, that thing will do zero to 60, you know, and it's just, that falcon, oh, dude, you know, and it's that kind of thing. We're all, like, looking under the hood. I started thinking about it, I realized, we got to start talking about why we're going, what this is all about, what's it for. So I created the Earthlight Institute to, uh, just, to do just that. What is Earthlight? Earthlight is a, an interesting blue-green light that bathes the moon. John Young, uh, one of the Apollo astronauts, told me the story. And when it bathes the moon, it is so bright you can read 12-point type. The cameras at the time, due to contrast ratios, et cetera, couldn't pick up that light. Um, but what was really interesting to me is I started thinking about it. That particular light, which is generated by a G-class star, just like ours, bouncing off, an Earth, off the planet Earth, is unique. That light, that spectra, that spectrum of light is a unique kind of light. So I wanted to get into the very core of what it is we do, why we do it. So this is the mission of the Earthlight Foundation, to carry the light of life to places now dark, the seeds of life to places now dead, and the eyes, hands, and minds of humanity to places yet unseen, untouched, and unknown. That's a very airy-fairy thing. But you know what? It's time for us to come out of the airlock. See, this is what we do. You're not making a profit right now. You know, the, the joke is, if you want to become a millionaire in space, start with a billionaire, um, or start with a billion. I mean, we're here because we have a belief. It's untested, unproven. It is a belief. It is a faith. It is an article of faith. And that's what we're about. I was able to bring together some good friends, uh, start the organization, a space artist named Pat Rawlings, whose work you'll see in here, and you've probably seen around in NASA, one of the uh, great space artists in the world. Another guy named Charles Collis, who is the head of advanced engineering for Dyson Limited, the vacuum cleaner people. Um, uh, Eric Evanson, who had done some DARPA work. Uh, Aaron Osterley, who's here. Uh, Luisa Fernandez. Uh, Luke Isaac, uh, and a few other folks who are uh, Justin Siples and some other people. And they've been working with me for a few months on this. We're starting to roll it out slowly. Um, I want to be very clear. Earthlight Institute is not an activist organization. Um, we are not competing with NSS or the Space Frontier Foundation, et cetera. We are going to be a home for the vision, but because I believe you can't be walking the walk unless you can, or talking the talk unless you can walk the walk, we're also going to be doing research and looking into various activities that support us. So vision, creating uh, you know, why we're going, where we're going. We are going to be non-denominational. We don't care where you want to go. Our job starts at LEO. We presume that the battles we're having now have succeeded, and you have made it. And we don't really care how you got there. Magic furry wings. I don't care. You're there. Now what do you do? Um, and to be credible, we have to create a technology path. Because at the core of this, this particular faith, unlike some others, is based on uh, or has to be carried out by people who are engineers and very rigorous, et cetera. So we're going to be looking at real activities to uh, make that work. There is a second element called the Earthlight Foundation. Um, in the case of Walt Anderson, uh, one of the best few years of my life was he put me in charge of an endowment. Yes, if you can find a billionaire, get one. 
Care and feeding is fairly simple. You just stroke their ego and do cool things and put their name on it. Um, but uh, I had one, and it was great. And he put $25 million in the bank. My job was to go spend the interest on cool space projects that will open the frontier. I was able to work on laser launch. I was able to do solar sails. I was able to work on, we did three or four Return of the Moon conferences. We did Senate roundtables. We did asteroid material processing, et cetera. By the way, most people don't realize it. Mir Corp was founded to do asteroid mining. And anybody was at the Roosevelt Hotel when we actually did the rollout, the famous party with the fog machine that got out of control and ran everybody out of the room, which is why they didn't see the posters on the wall that had asteroid mining images all over the place. But that was our uh, little inside joke. So the Earth Light Foundation is set up so that all donations will be tithed internally because we're not necessarily going to wait to find a billionaire, but if you're in the audience, come speak to me afterwards, please. Um, and um, what we're going to do is 10% of all donations will begin going into the endowment. So we're going to grow it ourselves. And then uh, when it reaches a certain level, that'll be handed off to a professional investment company to go make money. Um, these are our tasks, communicating a vision, bringing together a core cadre of leaders to catalyze the movement, enabling the development of credible, credible paths, critical paths, which is what we used to call it in the Space Studies Institute with Dr. O'Neill, um, and developing self-funding mechanisms growing a clearly directed space settlement community and culture here on Earth. That last point is key. The subtext of everything we're doing, see, we are in a, what I call a movable, movable church. That's what the space movement is. We are a movable church. We go to different hotels, which are our citadels, our churches. We listen to our priesthood, who reinforce our beliefs that when we leave these buildings, we go and try and tell our friends about who they don't get. And then we come back in and we act on it and we move and motivate ourselves and go and do things that act towards the realization of what we believe in here. So that's kind of what we're going to be doing underneath. The space settlement matrix is a part of what we're doing. It has three elements. Yes, we did get encyclopediagalactica.com. Um, that is going to be an ongoing wiki. That's an intake mechanism, students, people like that. Uh, by the way, we're looking for volunteers who want to work on any of these things. Um, the space development matrix is an interesting uh, element. You'll go into the space development matrix, it's a three-dimensional matrix. You'll go in and using TRL levels, te uh, technology readiness levels, NASA's approach to deciding whether something should be fielded or not, will be tied to color coding. So a TRL of one to three, which is basically theoretical, um, would be red, three to six will be yellow, uh, six to nine, which is sort of field tested or out there being utilized right now in space, um, would be green. You'll go in and you'll say, let's say I want to do uh, lunar ice uh, drill bits, and I go look it up. Now, I've looked up the background on the Encyclopedia Galactica. Think of these as organic trees with overlapping and intersecting halls or, or uh, limbs. Um, and so now you go in there and say, okay, I want to do lunar ice drill bits. Nobody's doing it. Okay, I'll introduce it as a topic. Now it's a red. Now I'm going to work on it. I'm going to do a paper on it. So I drop in my name. I'm an ISU group. I'm a, a National Space Society uh, chapter. I am a, a NASA group. I'm an entrepreneur with a company. I'm going to drop in my abstract or my business plan. I'm going to tell you when I'm going to be ready to talk about it. Um, and, uh, and off we go. And so people can find you, contact you, et cetera. Now when you become a member of the Space Development Matrix, or the space settlement matrix, you'll be involved in being able to vote this up and down vis-a-vis -vis priority as to whether it's relevant and important to the critical path. The idea here is a three-dimensional checklist that will allow us to gradually say, we've got that done. We've got that done. OK, now we need to focus on this. Oh, you know what? I haven't thought about that. And we want to open this up. This will be sort of an o working our ways into an open source approach to space. Because there is some kid in Mumbai, we're going to be sitting there, you know, we're going to be, oh, I need to be able to levitate this box and uh, uh, translate it from here to here um, and then reorient it this way. And I need to create an algorithm that I can put in a computer. And the kid's going to go, a handle? You know, that's the kind of thing that's going to happen if we open it up. They're going to come in and go, somebody's going to come in and go, I, I would try a handle. Oh, yeah, that works. So. That's the kind of thing. We want to open this up. We don't know who knows what we don't know. And we want to give them access and bring them in. Uh, the Realware Development Project, Charles Collis, who I mentioned from Dyson, is leading that. We're going to be doing open source space hardware. Um, there is debate and discussion as to whether open source hardware exists. Charles is one of the philosopher kings of this realm. According to him, and this is not my realm, I'm being educated. Uh, 
but uh, apparently there is a lot of work that needs to be done to do very basic open source hardware, to take it down to its basics. So we're gonna be going out and doing some grant proposals and creating the Realware project. And then there's individual projects. If you wanna come and work with us, just come talk to us. We're gonna communicate the vision through the art and media project that Pat Rawlings is leading. Uh, our friends at InSpace, we have the lead animator from Babylon 5, we have some other people involved. Uh, we're gonna be putting out vision. These are all mutually supportive activities. The idea is that this is gonna be vision driven but technically correct, uh, uh, you know, visualizations. Um, and I did steal Brian Versteeg, who is uh, uh, the one Eric Anderson was talking about. He developed this web page, or what will be the web page. This is one example of what we're gonna do, the infinite canvas. This is just a, a frozen shot. What they do is they're gonna take this scene, put it up, and if you're a member, a registered member, by the way, you have to pass a test to be a member of Earthlight. You have to agree that the human settlement of space and expansion of life beyond the Earth is the goal that you share, and give us some money unless you're an artist, because artists don't make money, but just give us a picture. Um, now, the artist will download this and put their own rover on it. And when he's done with it, or she's done with it, they'll upload it. Now, we have two pictures, one with a rover, one without. The next person can come in and take either the first one or the second one, download it, put the rover, that, you know, the next lander or the mining device or the ISRU device in there, put it back up. Now we have three pictures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and it begins to grow. And it, what we call the infinite canvas. And then on periodic basis, the best picture will be voted by the members, and that'll become one that goes into the rotation on the front page of the website, et cetera. We will eventually do this for asteroids. Um, we refer to that whole realm as free space, by the way, in Earthlight. Um, space Law and Policy Group, we're looking at a, an organization or a team within a group. I have a guy named Steve Wolf who wrote the original Space Settlement Act uh, and a couple of other people that are getting involved. Uh, we're gonna be looking at creating a, a team that's quasi, all these projects, by the way, are self-managed, quasi-independent projects. Uh, they're all very different in structure um, and, and have uh, different approaches to things. So they're gonna be going out and re-examining things from the perspective of settlement. This is not some AIAA subcommittee that's chartered to look at space law. These are, they're coming at it from settlement. And I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, underlying it all is the creation, again, as I said, of community and culture. Uh, I'm gonna use two really bad religious examples, but what the hell, it's, it's the morning. Um, the Puritans, when they came to this new world, had already created a culture. They had their culture, they had their art, their music, they had their belief sets, they had all of their culture, their, their hierarchy, their own mores and customs, etc. They took the spacecraft of the time, crossed the space of the time, and went to a new world. Uh, the Mormons in Missouri, uh, they took uh, the Conestoga wagons, the spaceship of their time, crossed the space of their period, and took their pre-established culture and put it into a new world. We have the beginnings of a space culture. It's all around us, especially if you see some of the young, young, younger crowd, the space up people, things like that. That's, that's turning into a culture. So the idea is to take that culture and give it a place to live, to prosper, to where the science, the art, the music, the fashion, the architects, everybody can work together and create this. Those of you who were around in the early days of SSI, I see at least one, maybe a few others of you, know what that was like, and it was an amazing time. We're gonna bring that back and make it bigger. New Worlds is the conference, four-day event, Moon, Mars, Free Space, and Earth, just because I like throwing people who don't get along together into the same place. So with any luck, I'll maybe get Paul Spudis to do the moon and Chris McKay Mars and John Lewis Free Space or SSI to run that. And Earth is spin back, not spin off. My, our point with Earth part, it's called Earth One, is that if we're gonna be on Mars taking soil and getting like really minute amounts of minerals out of it, why can't we do that in the Mongolian desert? If we're gonna be doing closed life support systems, why can't we create partially closed life support systems? And, and uh, you know, yes, we have to do biosphere and do it right so we can kind of erase that little giggle factor that comes up there. Um, somebody needs to go out and do that one. Uh, but why not? You know, why not bring it back that way? Um, it'll be an academic conference. There'll be a call for papers. These are gonna be peer review papers. There'll be a published volume. So you can say you were published, very high end. Uh, but we're gonna take in new ideas. Again, with the old Space Studies Institute conferences, we used to call them the not ready for prime time conferences. You could go in and say, I'm gonna mine ice on the moon because I think there may be you know, ice on the South Poles and not get laughed out of the room in the early 80s. And you, you'd get some pretty stiff questioning from people who knew what they were talking about. 
but you'd be in a place where, that was friendly to these kind of ideas. That's what we're going to do. Um, now, when you walk out the door, you're going to be in a renaissance event. Uh, Bill meets Ted meets Burning Man. I mean, it's just, the idea is to bring in this whole cultural milieu, this new energy. And again, if you've been around the Space Ups, if you've been to the Bill conferences, if you've been to the ISU, and you've recovered from ISU, if you've been to these different places and seen what's going on, there's a dynamic and energy, and we want to capture that and bring it together with the reality, the facts, the data, and the information. And then we're also going to be a home to big ideas. Um, we're looking at variable G research. Yes, we're going to talk to, trying to talk to SSI about that as well. Um, the watch, which is an asteroid uh, program we had for a few years, we want to bring that back. Permission to dream. Um, the idea of giving telescopes to kids and having them look at the moon and asteroids and things like that. Now, the interesting thing was we had this running for a few years, and the young volunteer who did it was a guy named George Whiteside. So uh, space science and theology, I just want to do that. I want to get like the Pope's people and some physicists and astron astronomers and throw them in a room for a week and just see what happens. You know, stuff like that. Big ideas. Now, why is this important? Because this all came from a big idea. This guy was, uh, Gerard K. O'Neill was my mentor. He's the godfather of soul of our movement. He's the man. He's the one who started it all, brought it all together, and put us all together, and gave us permission to dream. Many of the people you hear about either began with Space Studies Institute and Dr. O'Neill, or were in inspired by it, or came from organizations that those people that came from that movement founded and created. Why is it important that we talk about why and where we're going? Because this is what the world sees, a rich guy flying into space, a one percenter flying into space. What we have to do is recontextualize that. We have to begin to tell a new story, a new story that involves the people of the Earth and the future of the Earth, a new story that they can relate to, that they have the possibility of participating in, perhaps in suborbital uh, activities or flying CubeSats, things like that, but one that they can actually dream about as well. So we're going to catch them by the heart, we're going to catch them by the wallet, we're going to catch them by the hands so they can get involved. It's about Earth. This whole thing is about this planet and the future that we, we envision. It's about space settlement. We go to space to settle space, nothing less. I can't have an argument with somebody who says, well, let's just send robots. I can't hear that. You know, I, I, I don't have a, a, a translator device for that. See, I've crossed the paradigm shift. I'm on the other side. By the way, we get to use the P word, all right? A new interface on an iPhone is not a paradigm shift. I don't care what Steve Jobs or anybody else says. It's not a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift is a, an absolute change in the perceptual reality and the relationship between human beings and the universe they live in, okay? We get to use the word because what we're doing is on the level of Copernicus. We are going to a paradigm shift. And on one side of the paradigm shift, the arguments that made sense before don't make the same sense anymore. So yes, we'll send robots, but robots don't breed. Robots don't imagine, robots don't perceive, robots don't settle, human beings will follow. This is the way we've done it before. The space shuttle, brute force, let's go do it. Das space program, the Van Braunian approach, you know, you'll sit on your couch and be very proud of how we spend your government money until we will go into space. Well. It didn't work. In fact, you know, um, the model that did work was how we did the internet. Now, if we had done the internet the way we did space, this is what we would end up with. Again, some of you have seen these slides, but I want to make this point very deeply. The United States National Computer Enterprise, they would be located at national computer centers in strategically, politically uh, strategic states across the country. It would be the Ames National Computer Center, the Cape Kennedy National Computer Center. They would be named and they would be run by uh, a set of uh, people that had been around a long time. Um, you'd take your punch card in if you had an interesting result, or if you ever got to fly, and you got an interesting result, you might be able to go back a few years later and fly unless the program changed. That's, if that's what we would have in the computing world. What happened in the computing world was we gave it to the people and we get stuff like this. I won't leave that up too long because that's my personal page. We're in Silicon Valley. There was a revolution that occurred in this place, but it occurred because the government handed off on purpose, because there was a synergy, an active synergy to get that stuff out there. And look what happened. I mean, we're plugged into a global, global brain. I have a cell phone that if I have any, any question on Earth, 
pretty well that you can come up with. I can click it on and I am now matrixed into the global brain. It's an amazing thing that happened. So we went to the moon doing this DOS program approach. And, you know, I've said this before, and, and it's really interesting to me that there are people, there's a generation, some of whom don't believe we ever win. Again, key point. It's not about whether the flags are crooked or how many shadows are cast or this or that or the other. The reason some people don't believe we ever went to the moon is because we're not freaking there right now. That's the proof. You couldn't have the rest of this discussion if you could look up and see the city lights of, of you know, um, Armstrongville or whatever it is on the moon. If we do Mars the same way that we're talking about it with shuttle on steroids, SLS, whatever you want to call it, we'll get to Mars and 20 years afterwards there'll be a 3D Fox News vidcast questioning whether we ever went to Mars because we won't be able to stay. We have to do things in a way that allows us to stay. That's why we have to operate under what I call the frontier principles. Space is a place, not a program. You'll see some of them up on the wall here, by the way. Um, in a free enterprise democracies, opportunities are exploited by individuals or groups in the form of companies and private institutions. Frontiers are not opened by governments for the people, but by the people with the support of or in spite of their governments. And without extremely low cost, reliable, and regular access to space, can, there can be no frontier. And of course, lastly, nobody stays until somebody pays. There has to be a profit, whether it's a cultural profit um, or financial profit. Sometimes we forget the cultural profit. Cultural profit could be a, you know, monasteries. That's a cultural profit. Uh, ast astronomical observatories. Now they could be serviced by private companies, etc. But that's the use of the government dollars. By the way, keep in mind, are the United States, the people of the United States, have already agreed to spend 14, 15 billion dollars a year on space. What we're talking about is how they spend it and why. I believe they should spend it in the opening of a frontier, not on a near-term, dead-end set of jobs programs to please certain political constituencies. Um, we have to get up there and we have to get started. A hundred miles up, you're halfway to anywhere, one of my favorite quotes of all time. Now yes, the Earthlight Institute is focused on the anywhere while everybody else is taking care of the hundred miles but it's all of a piece. We have to do it. We have to begin developing an orbital infrastructure. That's one of the reasons we did the MIR. Orbital infrastructure, orbital industrial infrastructure. The reason the Europeans were able to deal with the North American experiment, the Vikings failed, et cetera, was that they had a coastal industrial infrastructure. They knew how to build ships. They knew how to hire crews. They knew how to insure ships. They knew how to fund missions. They knew how to deal with trade. They knew how to draw up contracts. They knew how to cover risk. They had governments that were able to interact with them. They knew how to do that because they'd been doing it up and down the coast of Europe and um, Asia Minor. So this is the end of the era, and there were so many people lamenting, oh my God, it's all over. Oh God, the space program is over. They didn't do it like we used to do. These kids will never get it, etc. And then, if I could see the video, the 30-second one, then something happened. Now, they hadn't noticed it was happening, but it, it, it's something that has happened. Alpha Fella takes that pressure. Three, two, one. That happened. By the way, that was shot by Kyle and Ryan, the in space production crew. Um, I think the series is coming, and I think Morgan Freeman's going to be involved. Because he's their go to guy. And if God says space is happening, it's happening, you know? So this happened. Amazing. A friend of mine's a friend of George Abbey, who's the guy who used to run Johnson Space Center, it was the guy who was charged with taking us out when we were doing the mirror. And his name is Israel Galvan. And Israel would call up George all the way through this mission. He'd say, George, SpaceX launched. And George, who mumbles a lot, would say, well, George was the guy you used to have to have a drink with if you were going to fly in space. He was the godfather of the old space program. And George would go, God, well, uh, yeah, they, they had a success, but now they got a birth. So then they birthed, and he called him up. And he said, George, they birthed. What do you think? This whole commercial thing's happening. And George said, well, uh, no, no, they have to uh, unbirth. And, uh, 
okay, well, okay, George. And he called him back up after they unbirthed and they came back there. He said, George, George, they landed successfully. The entire mission was a success. George was like, well, uh, okay, well, now they got to do it again. Some people, man, it takes them a little bit longer than others to get there. But new things are happening this year and it's, it's amazing stuff. This company, which is gonna be sitting in the heart of what some people would call the area of darkness, Alabama, Marshall Space Flight Center. I just think that's either uh, one of the craziest things I've ever heard or one of the most brilliant. Uh, Senator Shelby has been a long opponent of some of the things we're into, who represents Alabama, will now have this in the middle of his district. I just think that's awesome. One of the great announcements that occurred that most people didn't really pay attention to, but it was, it was fairly quiet, quiet and probably one of the most important things that was happened in the last year, was that Bigelow and SpaceX agreed to work together. Now think about it. A private transportation system going to a private destination. The loop, the closing of the loop. The government is not even in a part, any part of that now. The baby's born, the baby's happening. We have PRI, asteroid mining, we have Excalibur Almaz. Uh, I was in the Isle of Man recently looking at some of their stuff. They want to orbit the moon. It's amazing. Things are starting to happen. We're on our way. The baby is being born. And of course, the foundation. You know, I, I, I got to tell you, I had, I had an interesting conversation many years ago with uh, one of the founders of Yuri's Night, who, you know, it's like, let's dance for space. And, uh, and I love Yuri's Night. It's a great party. It's awesome. I totally, we helped them. The Space Frontier actually did the processing of their first financial transactions for them. And I sat down with her, and, and at the time, the Lord of the Rings had, came out, had just come out. And I said, you know, Loretta, I said, Loretta, you know, the, um, all that dancing and partying you do, it, to me, it's kind of like the hobbits, you know, at the pub. They're all dancing and having a great time. And then there's this guy in black over in the corner. He's called a ranger, and the hobbits really think he's weird, and they can't get close to him. Okay, that's the foundation. That's the Space Frontier Foundation. You know, he's, they are between you and Sauron so that you can have a good time and do this stuff. And that's what the foundation has done for years. And that's what the next generation of the foundation is doing. Um, forgive my Latin, just write me a letter, I don't care. Um, <clears throat> this is 4 a.m. this morning I did this. Um, this is gonna be a battle that the foundation is gonna keep fighting. Cause uh, you know, it ain't all over yet and we have to put a stake in the heart of the zombie eventually. Um, it's a zombie, stakes don't work. Have to cut its head off, put a stake in it, set it on fire, and I don't know, cast it in a bad rerun of a bad sitcom. Um, anyway, we, this is gonna be the battle. This is gonna be what's happening. Now on the other hand, oh and this is being against something, I think at the same time it's important that we be for something. So getting back to this idea of a vision, a grand uniting vision as to what we can be for, because this is fighting around the edges. You know, okay, we're gonna get commercial space another 100 million, and we are, I mean, there's bodies on the floor. Oh, we got them 100 million. Oh, man, that's awesome. And it is, it's important, but you're fighting around the edges. We gotta change the central goal of the activity. We have to change the conversation. It's on one of these banners here. Uh, we have to change the context of the discussion. So we have to go to the core of the matter. And to me, the core of the matter is why we go into a space as a nation. I'm slipping into my foundation hat here now. Why we go into the space as a nation? Why do we have a human spaceflight program? Obviously, human settlement. That's it, and we have to declare it. The goal of the United States Human space program is for this nation to settle space. Period, end of story. Now, why is that important? It's like, oh, it's way at the top level. If you change the top level, the cascading decisions that come down from that have to be changed to correlate with, or they should be in an ideal world that doesn't involve the US Congress, has to be changed to correlate to the, act, to the goal at the top. That's what we should do as a focus. I believe the Space Frontier Foundation, the other groups, uh, in this country should make this the focus of our next 16 to 18 months. Change the core conversation. Oh, it's already been done. This is, why, this is where it gets fun. 1988, Steve Wolf, working with Congressman George Brown, a liberal Democrat from California, introduced a bill that said it was the goal of the United States to settle space. It was called the Space Settlement Act of 1988. And for four incredible years, the goal of the United States in space was settlement. 
It was the goal. That's why we were doing it. NASA hated it. Dan Golden hated it. In fact, he used to give it to one of his low-level assistants, a woman named Lori Garver. And he would say, please, take care of this crap. Get these people off my back. Eventually, because the space movement did what we always do, after the bill got passed, we decided to go fight about a launch vehicle called the National Launch System. That's what we do, because we're engineers and people like that. That's what we understand. So while we were over there fighting about a launch system, this got sunsetted and went away. Let's bring it back. So we're talking to a Republican congressman who might be interested in introducing it this year. And will give us something to fight about next year, or fight for next year. The Space Settlement Act of 2013. Now the beauty of it now is we have social media, we have a whole new young generation. Oh, and we have the existence proof of people who actually believe this, have money, are making investments, and actually doing it. Let's do it again. How beautiful it is. I love the fact that all we have to do is change a couple of words, go back to them and say, oh, by the way, President Reagan signed the first one. That takes care of one party right there. Oh, by the way, it was introduced by a liberal Democrat. That takes away the other party. Oh, and by the way, you've already done it. So let's just do it again. First of all, if they don't, we got a tool we can embarrass them with. And as we're doing it, we get to have a conversation about why new space exists, why commercial space is happening, what's going on, and what's the context of it. We get to have this conversation, and that's our hook. We get to talk about this planet, why this planet is important, why it's important that we get off this rock and have this happen in the future, that the space settlement becomes the imperative for the human race, led by the United States. I say the United States because that's the country I'm in. Actually, I live in a country called Texas, but we're closely affiliated with the United States. It's all about getting out there. The moon, our lifeboat, where we learn to go live on the surfaces of other worlds. Commercial activities, robotics, the Google InterX Prize, it's coming. We're, we're right there. It's starting to happen. Lunar bases, lunar facilities, the first communities. I believe in a two-base lunar solution. I believe that we should have a pure NASA learning how to go to Mars facility on the far side, and then the people who are um, operating that, supporting that, you know, throwing bugs into the system to see how they react, or would be based at the South Pole, and they would be housed in commercially funded sort of COTS style funded habitats and facilities. We could have astronomers, private citizens, and the people that are supporting the guys doing the pure NASA function on the far side, and then when they're ready, they go off to Mars. I love this one because it's green. I just, I'm a tree hugger. I'm a technologist and a tree hugger. Again, the paradigm, it shifts. Want to go to Mars, awesome. We'll be talking about that in a few minutes. I want to see those pictures. I want to see the first live 3D shot coming from the lady's camera as she looks down in the Val Maroneras. I want to see the cities of Mars begin. I want to see asteroids. I want to see what's going to happen. What, what can we do? Cities in space, free space. Using the resources of space, we can build anything we want. We can build it as large as we want. By the way, when I was at Dyson, I spoke at Dyson uh, a couple of weeks ago, two things occurred to me. First of all, note to self, don't make any vacuum jokes. Uh, but I did slip in some discussion of spinning. And I said, you know, they call this a Taurus. Uh, they call this the uh, Stanford Taurus. So wouldn't it, it's, I think it's time for a new name. I think we should call it the Dyson Rotating Habitat. And maybe you should fund a study on that. Um, it's an amazing future. It's an unlimited future. We can go out there. We can do anything we want, build it as big as we want. It's available to you. It's available to us. And it came from this book, The High Frontier, Gerard K. O'Neill. O'Neill cylinders, miles long, tens of thousands of people, as big as you want them. By the way, the whole Starship thing, totally support it, but a Starship is just a great big habitat with a big fracking motor on the end of it. So we have to learn these skills. It's time for us to come out of the airlock. It's time for us to come out and say, I believe in this. 
yes, I've got a business plan that closes and, and, and here's my exit strategy and here's this and that and here's my, that, that, that's great. And I believe in something. I'm doing this because I believe in something. I believe that this point of light on the edge of this galaxy is important and it's here for a purpose and I am here for a purpose. That's what gets me up in the morning. Yeah, I want to make a profit. I run a nonprofit. I don't do so well at it, as Bob will tell you. But I do this because I believe in something. This is important. The frontier is calling us, and it's calling us not out of accident. I don't, I don't believe we're here by accident. I believe that human race is, is at the end of a chain of events that are not just spectacularly awesome, amazingly coincidental, but something else is going on. I don't know what that is. You know, my talk has been called, I've called my talk God and Rockets. I don't, whatever you call God, I don't care if you call God some guy with a beard or a bunch of people in togas hurling lightning bolts or somebody sitting in a lotus position or whatever, I don't care. But there's something going on here. 14 billion years after the universe was created, by the way, the universe was, according to theory, all created at the same time in the Big Bang. We'll come back to that in a second. 14 billion years after this happens, this solar system starts coming together, or not but 10 billion years, so about 4 billion years ago, 4.7, whatever, the solar system starts to congeal. Now, it happens to congeal around a sun that happens to be just this right particular size. Um, not too big, if it was like a few percent larger, um, you know, it would burn out. If it was a few percent smaller, it would be too cold. It happens to throw off the, you know, it has certain, um, uh, materials floating around it to congeal in certain levels uh, and there's a sweet spot created we happen to have a planet that congeals uh, you know in that sweet spot oh and it's not just a planet it's a binary planet so it's a planet that has a molten core which generates an electromagnetic field which happens to be the kind of thing you need to do to stop cosmic rays which really give life a bad day all right, and now it's, so it's got a cosmic field around it that protects the life that's in it. It happens to be a binary planet system with a moon that's just the right size to stabilize it and keep it from wobbling wildly. So the seasonal variations are within some sort of norm. And again, it's within that exact distance. If we were just a few percent further out, a few percent closer in, we wouldn't be here. It all fits, it all starts to tie together and then because of this, we get, begin to see the generation of, uh, of different uh, biochemical reactions that occur over billions of years. And out of this, some sort of uh, living systems evolve that exist in the particular atmosphere of the time, which would be deadly to us now. And because of their interactions with that atmosphere, they convert that atmosphere into, a, into an atmosphere that we, in our biological form, can now deal with. And now that system begins to uh, congealed to higher and higher levels of life and eventually at some point that life begins to move and that life begins to come up on the shore. By the way, there has to be a shore. Why is there a shore? Because of the activities of the plates of the planet flowing on the molten core because if that wasn't there then the ocean would be the same depth all over the planet and there would be no land for it to arise to. It started, it's an amazing set of coincidences. Oh, and by the way, every few hundred thousand years, a uh, big rock comes in and knocks everything all to hell, disrupting the system that was there before, but not quite enough to completely eliminate all the life that was there before, but just to give this other kind of life a chance to move up the scale, and on and on. Coincidence? I don't know. I don't know. And that's just to get you to algae, and now algae and, and Algae you know, begins to reorganize and off you come and now something comes out of the ocean and crawls up on the shore. And that thing crawls up on the shore and begins to interact in that atmosphere and that a new ecosystem is created. And so now you've got these living things and they're running around up there on, on the ground. Now keep in mind, yes, there may be life out there in the universe. There may be intelligent life in the universe and I know we're in California so Whatever, but there may be intelligent life out there. And I'm glad, and I want it to be there. And I celebrate the fact that it might be there. But we have to ask ourselves sometimes, what if it's not? What if we're it? Yes, billions and billions of stars, the probability, the statistics. You know what, statistics are great. Vegas lives on statistics. But what I'm betting, I want to know what I got in my hand. 
What's in front of me right now is one world, one planet, one ecosystem, one civilization, this one. And this is the one I'm betting on. This is the one I have to cherish. This is the one I have to take care of. And by God, this is the one I'm going to spend my life and dedicate my life to spreading. Because I believe it's important. I believe it's beautiful. I believe the human race is an amazing thing. Keep in mind, again, you're going through all these evolutions, and at some point, you know, you end up with these creatures that drop down out of trees because of a climactic change occurring, because of some of these interactions I've just talked about. And now they have to go forage for themselves. And now they have to stand up and look around. And we have interactions with different levels of protein intake and standing up and blah, blah, blah. And their brains start to grow and their culture starts to grow and they start to live. And yet here comes another asteroid in because they drop in about, you know, every few minutes. If it's a, if it's a 24 hour clock, every few minutes, a big rock's hitting the earth or a volcano is blowing up somewhere. Now, these bipedal creatures, these monkey boys, these, you know, animals start to organize themselves into cultures and societies. And through a whole series of interactions and sets of possibilities and probabilities, we end up here in the 20th century. And by the way, if my outstretched arms are the history of life on Earth, I just destroyed civilization for its entire history, right there. Just that little tiny flick on the end of my nail is the history of human civilization. Don't get cocky, you know? We're just starting. An amazing coincidence now. Here we are in the 20th century. We have the tools to destroy ourselves. We have the rockets to be able to launch deadly payloads to the other side of the planet and destroy our enemies, which will, who will destroy us in a mutual orgy of mass destruction and we all are dead. That's happened in the last 100 years. We could kill the entire planet right now. And yet those same tools, those same rockets, those same computers that do the algorithms and decide where those rockets are going to go, who they're going to kill, what the collateral damage is going to be, those same tools are the ones that allow us to reach for the stars. Coincidence? I don't know. It's amazing to me. It all has come together. And here we are in this moment, in this period of time, right now, in this hundred year span that takes place in that little tiny fleck of what we call the rise of civilization, that tiny little moment, it all comes together and the money arrives and we haven't killed ourselves and we've got the technology and some guys are sitting out on a hunk of asphalt out in the Mojave Desert and they hit a button and something takes off. Something moves. Civilization moves. Civilization is moving. We are about to take it to the next level. The people in this room, the people building those rockets, the kids that go out there and they can't send them. You know, when I hear these astronauts, oh, I almost called them ancient astronauts. Um, when I hear these astronauts go, oh, back in the day we were doing it. You couldn't. Man, these guys were amazing. Go to SpaceX. Go to Mojave. Go, go see Mastin. Go talk to those kids. Go, go watch them. They, they don't go home. You know, they almost have to, like, push them out, electrify the fence so they can't come back in and keep working on the rockets. They're out there. They're doing it. We have to give them the possibility. We have to infuse them with this dream, finance them, support them, keep them from being wiped out by people who don't get it, and allow them the chance to make this happen. We are here for a reason. And that's the reason. That little tiny blue speck of life floating in a place of darkness and death is the reason we exist. Now we can go a little more theological if we want. I mean, I believe I'm here because without me to look at the universe, the universe doesn't know of its own existence. You know, it goes back to that old line, uh, if a tree falls in the forest, is there a sound? No, there's no sound. There's just a vibration, right? The vibration now goes out because this organic uh, entity has translated from a vertical to a horizontal and sent out a series of waves. Those waves go through the air, interacting with molecules, pushing other molecules, and they hit a membrane in here, and that translates 
through some liquid and into a bone, and that bone translates into an electronic impulse. That electronic impulse begins to go through some neurons. Those neurons spread to other neurons, which have an interactive set of relationships. Those neurons now pull together, and it says sound. And it says tree falling. And now I hear tree falling, and I look over, and I go, oh, the tree fell. And oh, I remember now that tree fell on my dog, and I hate it when trees fall. Or, the Lumberjack show on whatever, Discovery Channel, I love that show. And we create a relationship for it, we contextualize it, we talk about it, we give it meaning. Because there was no meaning before. See, the universe has no meaning without us. We create the meaning, we create the universe. As Robert Heinlein said in Stranger in a Strange Land, thou art God. We are it. We are here to do that. So, we have a great civilization, we have this thing called life, and we have a rationale at the level of the universe that calls us forth because, you know, we have to go out there and see and touch and taste and feel so that the universe knows all about itself. And then people say we're at the end of days. You've heard the line. This planet, this one little planet, this one solar system, is less than what would be the equivalent of one grain of sand on all the beaches and deserts in the entire planet compared to what's out there. And somebody has the nerve to tell me it's over? Somebody who, who hasn't walked into a SpaceX or, or a Sierra Nevada or one of these companies that see these kids has the nerve to tell me imagination is dead, creativity is dead? Shut up, leave me alone. I got things to do. The frontier is calling. And it's our frontier. We can go together. For the first time in human history, we won't be taking it from somebody else. For the first time, we get to go together based on the merits. All of us. For the first time in the history of life, the expansion of human technology does not mean the retreat of the quote-unquote biosphere. This is where the paradigm really screws some people up. We, by building technological structures and, and, and uh, creating technological activities in space, will be expanding the biosphere and protecting the biosphere. Some of my friends in the eco movement will come up, oh my God, you're gonna go kill space like we've done the Earth, blah, blah, blah. you heard Eric talk about it. I say, hold it, now would you rather rip the heart out of a living mountain on the Earth, destroy all the downstream with your tailings and all this, or would you go rather mine a dead rock that's gonna hit us and kill us? And their eyes roll back in their head. They don't know how to have the discussion. Spreading the seeds of life to worlds now dead. That's why I'm here. Imagine a kid growing up in a few years who can look up into the sky and see spacecraft traveling out there, the first trees getting planted on Mars, the first uh, you know, butterflies flying on the moon. Things like that are going on. Life is expanding. Humanity is expanding and carrying life, carrying the seeds of life. What a purpose, what a, what a thing. You know, we walk around, people walk around, why am I here? Why am I here? I got your answer right here. This is why you're here. This is why you're here. It's a vision worth living for, to carry the light of life to places now dark, the seeds of life to places now dead, and the eyes and hands and minds of humanity to places yet unseen, untouched and unknown. We are the eyes, eyes, ears, hands, feet, and interpreting mechanisms of the universe. We are God, as far as I'm concerned. In that sense, we are here to do that. It's not just about rich boys and their toys. It's not just about tourists. It's not just about people trying to make a ton of money. Yes, we need to do all of those things to make this happen. But it's far more important than that. It's all about living a dream and making it happen. Thank you.